Welcome to the Cashflow Project Podcast. Are you looking to better your financial situation by increasing your cash flow? Too busy to hunt for real estate deals or don't know where to start? Then you're in the right spot. Join us as we dive in and talk about investing for cash flow using multifamily real estate. Welcome to the Cashflow Project. I'm your host, Vince Gethings. On our guest today is Max Fish. Max is the founder of Real Estate Project Solutions. And he focuses on, well, he uses 20 years of real estate experience and he focuses on uh, mainly wholesaling and flipping these days with uh, around $6 million in transactional volume every year. Uh, the key to Max's success, though, is he has been able to outsource and delegate a lot of his tasks uh, in building and leveraging VAs. Uh, to help him scale. So that is going to be the big topics that we want to talk today uh, with Max about is how he came to this point of scaling a business uh, through uh, outsourcing and VA. So Max, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vincent. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, kind of tell, tell us a, a bit about yourself and where you're located and uh, kind of how you got your start in real estate investing. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, I'm uh, I'm based in the, the Philadelphia market. Uh, my office is uh, just outside the the uh, city limits, and um, I uh, have I have a small small team, small office here, and got started in the real estate business um, early 2000s. I um, uh, actually uh, was um, uh, working in the in the car business, doing sales um, in basically in college and a buddy of mine had started a, uh, um, a mortgage a mortgage company. And he was, you know, trying to, trying to poach me, get me to come over. And, um, uh, I went ahead and I took the leap and that's how I got into real estate is through the mortgage business. So, you know, I was, uh, you know, I don't know, 19 or 20 or something like that. And, and, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, was seeing appraisals and saw an opportunity and, uh, you know, figured I know everything, right? Because I've been in the business six months or a year, whatever it was, and and I bought this this first property that ended up being my first flip. I sold uh, 03, 04, something like that, and um, yeah, I've been in the business, you know, in one form or fashion ever since. So today, I have a, a full time wholesale uh, rehab business here in, in Philadelphia. It's um, by no means a large operation, but it does what I want. It's pretty steady, and it, as you said in the intro, I outsourced. Uh, quite a bit of it. So um, good, um, you know, good balance. Um, I certainly like to work, but I like, you know, I have other, other interests as well. All right. So as you started scaling, um, when, when did you see your first deal you said uh, 02 to 04 and maybe you did one or two at what point uh, did you actually like start to scale? Like, it, you know, you're saying to yourself, maybe hey, I have something here. Let me, let me see if I can, you know, blow this thing out. Like, when did that happen? What, what was your kind of thought process and challenges you had? So it's a lot of people have that issue. You know, they, they, they'll read a couple books and you know, maybe they've been in bigger pockets, read some of Brandon Turner's books or whatever. And they're like, okay. And they can get one or two deals. And then, and then they, they get stuck very, very quickly. Oh, it's like, okay, I did one or two. Now what, how do I do five a year? How do I do 10 a year? Um, and a lot of people can't make that leap. So how were you able to make that leap? Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting, you know, a couple of things. I mean, I tell people a lot of times if I want to, you know, blow everybody's mind, you know, Facebook wasn't around when I got started in the business and, you know, things like that. So a lot of the technology didn't exist, right? So, you know, things like um, the dialer systems, these different direct mail systems, um, you know, Zapier integrations, all this technology didn't, didn't really exist. So, um, as far as you know, the the um, you know the the scaling and and the outsourcing and, and using VAs and that kind of thing that really didn't start until uh, you know I don't know you know five six now nah, longer than that probably six or seven years ago something like that um, I actually started the business in in uh, southern New Jersey where I grew up and um, oh I don't know. Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe a, f a few years prior to really starting to scale, um, I decided to focus exclusively on the Philadelphia market just because it was a bigger market. There's more going on. And um, and then uh, I would say 
maybe like a year or two, um, you know, really kind of, you know, doing the direct mail and, and, you know, I had an acquisitions guy, but I didn't really have much of a team. Um, and I very quickly realized that in order to, uh, to get real traction, you need, you know, you think of a funnel, you know, you gotta, you gotta have a bunch of leads in the front end. You need to do a lot of follow-up and, and so on and so forth. And, and that was, I think the point where I really realized that I needed, um, uh, you know, I need a lot more bodies, um, to, uh, you know, to work through things because I mean, something even as simple as comps, you know, uh, valuing properties or, or underwriting deals. I mean, that takes time. And if you're looking at, you know, five, six, eight, ten 10 deals a day, I mean, it's, it's, you know, that in itself is a full-time job. So I'd say that was about the time I realized that I needed to, to really, um, you know, start to develop a team and, and, and systematize things. So you decided that you needed more people that your, your bandwidth is getting low. Uh, you're getting maybe burnt out and you need more people. How do you decide which tasks and processes that you're going to delegate down to uh, your new team members, um, whether it's a team member or a VA or something like that, um, mm -hmm. and which ones you're going to keep your focus on um, as the business owner and leader of the company? Yeah. So I actually, um, I went the, the traditional route, right? I hired W2 employees. I had my workers comp, I had my payroll and, and, um, and, uh, all of that all really started with, um, you know, so in the, in the beginning, I'm, I'm doing everything myself. I'm wearing all the hats, right? So, you know, I slowly started, you know, I got, I get my bookkeeper and, you know, and then I realized that I got to do lead gen. And so I hired a bunch of people to do lead generation. Um, you know, I, I, the, the, the lead generation piece is what really got me focused on VAs and getting away from W2 employees. Um, and that is the point at which I recognize that like, for example, me, developing mail campaigns, me doing the phone calls, me, that, that makes no sense. And I also couldn't have my acquisitions guy doing it because he needs to be out in the field closing deals. So what I did was I, you know, like everybody else, as you said, listen to some books, listen to podcasts. Um, I uh, came across, you know, in bigger pockets, maybe one of them, but, um, and the, uh, the individual was talking about highest and best use of your time. And that's really how I looked at it. So I thought to myself, you know, what, what is it that I'm doing that's, that's the biggest contribution as far as revenue is concerned to the company? And that was um, selling the deals. So uh, my acquisitions guy's out doing his thing. I start to develop my team so that we have the, the lead gen side covered and I'm focused on selling the deals. Um, and I, I did it that way because, again, being in the rehab business, I wanted to have the ability to decide if I want to purchase this property myself and renovate it or if I want to wholesale it. Um, and so that was kind of my that was kind of my thinking. But again, all all around highest and best use of my time, you know, highest revenue generating activities. All right. So from there. You're focusing on highest and best use of your time or the highest revenue producing uh, activities, and you're starting to delegate them down. So you said you hired W2 employees first, and then at some point you transitioned to or added on virtual assistants. Mm -hmm. um, how did that go? I, I've heard more bad experiences with, with virtual assistants than good ones, and, and myself included is in that. Uh, that, you know, camp, um, with just my experience with them. So, um, how did you kind of overcome the common pitfalls? Like what kind of structure did you put in place or systems and processes to ensure that you're, uh, having virtual assistants that are active as force multipliers and adding to the company rather than just, uh, you know, just another burden because whatever issues of them being, you know, remote. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I, um, so just kind of take a step back. So I, I, um, you know, picture, you know, again, six, seven years ago, something like that. I have um, the makings of a team. I have my acquisitions guy at this point, my dispositions guy, and I'm, I'm doing my rehabs and doing my thing. And um, I had a, uh, a call center kind of set up with cubicles and stuff in my office. 
Uh, and at one point I had eight uh, folks that I had hired, um, you know, younger people. These are 10, $12 an hour people um, making calls, text messages, um, responding to incoming calls, direct mail campaigns, that kind of stuff. And um, we had all kinds of issues, like typical issues you have when you hire people. But, um, you know, being close to Philadelphia, you know, we're talking a lot of, um, you know, a lot of folks, you know, young people from the city and stuff. And, um, you know, people, I caught the one kid sleeping in his car, you know, all that kind of nonsense. Um, so a buddy of mine had said, you know, look, why don't you try VAs? And so I said, okay. So it took me, um, we had a couple of incidents where I finally just said, look, I'm, I'm done here. I end up letting everybody go. Um, and it took about, about six months to a year to really kind of figure out how to, um, you know, really, um, hone in the process. Um, I break it down um, into three categories, um, hiring, training, and management. And uh, once I got that down, it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, but um, y- you know, as far as avoiding um, you know, the, the pitfalls I'd say of, of outsourcing, it's really just, you know, just systematizing everything um, you know, having good, good systems, um, good tools, and then good, good management personnel to, to, you know, to keep an eye on people. Um, you know, today we have a, you know, a, a, a human resource department. We have our, you know, we're, we're set up that that's become a whole separate business, but we're set up like any other company. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's kind of interesting because all the stuff that's kind of come about and is now commonplace as a result of COVID uh, is stuff that we were doing prior um, because our people were, you know, were remote. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's just checks and balances, you know, it's, it, it's, it, you know, you give people tasks, you make sure that the tasks are getting done on time. And, and in the meantime, you got to make sure that they're, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing and, you know, typing the keyboard and, and, um, you know, we've learned over the years how people try to game the system and, and those kinds of things. And, um, you know, we, we interview a lot of people, so we get very good talent and that's really where it starts. Um, you know, interviewing four or 500 people a month. What are your favorite, um, let me rephrase that. What are your best tools that you use uh, to, to manage your virtual assistants or this team to keep mm-hmm. everyone on track and synergistic? Yeah, that's, um, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, just some, some tools, uh, like right off the top of my head, you know, something like a time doctor, which is, uh, you know, essentially like a, like a, a virtual or digital, uh, time clock, um, you know, make sure that people are clocking in and, and working the hours. Um, you know, something like that has, you know, does screenshots and stuff like that to make sure that again, that people are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, not playing video games or something, uh, during work hours. Um, and something like Basecamp or Asana, uh, we use for, you know, various projects, um, it, you know, within the company, um, we use, um, uh, you know, all the, uh, aside from that, really all the traditional, you know, kind of softwares and, and tools for, for any other business. But the other big component is, is good people, you know, um, again, it's kind of, you know, out of, out of my, uh, experience grew this grew real estate project solutions, which is now a separate business. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that company has, I think 21 or 22, you know, management personnel now. Um, so just good people to then keep an eye on, you know, again, hire, right, manage properly. Um, you know, the other folks that are, that are, that are working, um, on behalf of, of third-party clients. Uh, good stuff. So I have two questions uh, follow up on that. So when when you have systems like Asana, and that's what we use too, so I'm going to dig out on that one. Um, that's our project management, task management software we use in, across all three of my companies. And the biggest, that, that obviously, you know, that, that software is incredibly useful, very robust. Um, how do you get over the actual discipline of getting people to actually use it religiously like you want them to? That's the biggest hurdle I have is we have this great big tool. It, it's, it, it will solve a lot of problems, keep everything on track, but it's only as good as the discipline of every team member using it. Um, so how, how do you get over that hurdle? Because that's one that I personally had where you know, we integrate a new you know, widget into the, into the, the mix here and you know, half the people adopt it. And then the other half is like do it for a couple of weeks and they go back to post-it notes or something like that. So 
uh, how did, how do you get over that? Yeah, that's, um, that, that's, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that you bring that up. Cause that's a problem that, that we hear quite a bit. Um, uh, you know, for us, um, I think that it's, we're very, um, uh, we're very specific about, you know, what we're looking for, um, in an individual, what the specific role is, that kind of stuff. So, you know, when we, when we start the, um, I don't know, the, the, uh, the call the, the hiring process, the vetting process, we're very, um, upfront about, you know, these are the tools that we're using. These are, the, this is the, the training that we're going to be doing with you, you know, that kind of stuff. And we kind of hammer home, like, listen, um, it, you know, if you don't feel comfortable kind of getting on board with our process, you know, we might as well, we might as well not proceed. Um, however, if you are, then there's a lot of incentives and, and, and things like that, uh, and you'll be well rewarded. So, you know, something as simple as, um, as like an Asana or base camp, as far as project management tools go, um, you know, it's, it's very cut and dry. So we're going to train on it. This is what we're using. Um, you know, part of the task could be, you know, updating the various projects. Um, either you do it or you don't. And, um, you know, again, goes back to checks and balances, but, you know, I think that good training is key so that everybody feels comfortable. Um, what I, what I have found personally, um, not just with outsource folks and, and real estate project solutions, but like in my own, you know, um, uh, real estate business, um, whether it's wholesale or rehab or, or whatever, um, people are, in general, creatures a habit. You know, they have their tools, they have their systems that they like, that they feel comfortable about. And if you if you try to um, make a change, um, it, that's very difficult. Um, we've actually implemented software in in various uh, parts of our business. So, the human resources department, you know, we have a uh, what we call an ATS application uh, tracking software solution for that. We have um, we actually use Basecamp, so we have Basecamp for the operation side. Um, and then our CRM for the for the sales side, and we've implemented these systems. It, we spend a lot of time, a lot of due diligence, making sure it's the right system. Um, and then from there, it's again, if we're going to bring somebody on board in the sales department, like look, this is what we use. Get on board, we'll train you on it. But if you don't use it, you know, it's just it's not going to be a fit, and it, it's pretty cut and dry. But I know that's a long winded answer, but essentially training. I think a lot of training, getting people to feel comfortable with it, is how you ensure that they use these systems. Also, I, I, I would imagine uh, setting, like you mentioned uh, earlier, to the expectations very, very early on, very, very clear about these are our expectations. Um, and then that way you can hold them accountable to that. So Absolutely. you mentioned a couple of times, you know, the things you're looking for in candidates or applicants. What are some of like the, I don't know if it's a personality trait or the the way they answer questions or the way they, uh, the resume looks? Is there is there something like what are some of the specific things that you're looking for of like, okay, that's an indicator of a good virtual assistant. Like they have the discipline to be able to work remote without somebody, you know, checking up on them at nine in the morning, making sure they're clocked in. Right. So what are some of the things uh, that you're looking for um, when, when hiring? Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. I don't know that there's any one thing in particular. Um, so uh, everybody gets a, a personality profile assessment. Um Everybody, you know, everybody. Uh, and again, we're we're now putting these folks out there, um, you know, for for uh, for clients. Um, so, you know, we have to be very careful. Um, you know, they're all getting background checks. They're all, um, you know, getting a medical, um, you know, clearances, um, you know, whether it's having to sit, you know, stare at a computer, you know, for a certain period of time. Um they're all signing non-disclosure agreements, you know, they're handling in some cases, sensitive data. So we're, we're, you know, we're obviously, um, you know, very much in touch with that, you know, and I think each job, each role is a little different. So, you know, we, um, we hire globally and we hire uh, and place people for various um, positions, right? So it could be cold calling, it could be acquisitions, it could be, you know, dispositions or, um, you know, anything and everything real estate. Um, so, you know, an acquisitions guy is a lot different, for example, from a, from a, you know, from a workflow personality, 
you know, standpoint than somebody who's simply doing cold calling or texting. Um, at the end of the day, there's definitely a basic standard that people have to have to meet. Um, a lot of resume fraud, things like that. So, you, you, you know, you have to really you have to be very, very careful about how you hire in your process, because um, relying on something as simple as a resume, um, you can't do that anymore, especially with remote employees. Yep. Good, good point. Um, all right. Switching gears back to more of the real estate. Mm -hmm. uh vein here is so 2002 2004 you get started you start scaling up um what are some of the biggest mistakes you've made as you're as you're going through a kind of this growth phase of scaling up over the last you know 20 years that you've been, been in the game yeah yeah that's uh that's a great question i love that one um i um you know, it's funny. I think for me, um, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, uh, even my very first deal, which I tell people uh, who ask, I wouldn't do that deal today if I, you know, if I had the opportunity to do it again, um, because it was too risky. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're a kid, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so I think that I, the mistakes I made, um, you know, specifically was, was, um, not taking, um, big enough risks, but, but the right kind of risks. Um, you know, I, I, I did that first project. I was, again, I was very lucky, but, you know, I, I look back now and I, I hear people today talk a lot about like um, shiny object syndrome. And I, I, I was, I had that as well. Uh, but I didn't search out a mentor. That was a big mistake. Um, again, I didn't take enough um, of the right kind of risks. Um, I didn't build on my success in the sense that, um, you know, when I did that first project, I was still in the mortgage business. Um, and instead of like really drilling down on one thing, I continued to, to try to manage what ultimately was two separate businesses, which again, turned out okay. But, you know, I think it was like clarity, um, consistency, focus, finding a mentor, like those were the mistakes that I made. Um, you know, if, I guess if you want to call them mistakes, um, but, but I think that, that those were the, those were some of the big ones. Um, and then the other thing is not getting involved in, um, uh, raising, raising money, whether it's equity or, or, you know, um, uh, private, you know, private, uh, private lender debt. Um, you know, I, I had, I was kind of, I, again, you don't know what you don't know, but I, I had, thought that the way to do it is with banks and that's just what people did. And um, so there was definitely a lack of creativity in the beginning. I think that also, um, you know, I, I'm not complaining, but I, I think I'd be a lot further along today had I, had I been more, you know, more focused on some of that stuff. Um, especially looking at the young guys coming up nowadays. I mean, with YouTube and different sources and mentors and it, people were just so much more fortunate today than I was when I started. Were you part of any like, uh, like RIAs or anything like that when you, when you got started? No, not really. Um, I, uh, I knew some, some real estate agents. I, you know, I did some various networking groups and things like that, but, but it, it wasn't, um, and that stuff was out there, but it, it, yeah. it just, it, again, I, I, because I didn't have a mentor, I didn't really have anybody look up to. I mean, when, you know, when, you know, when you're you know, 19, 20 years old, 21, I mean, a lot of my buddies were, you know, I don't know, swinging hammers or, or doing, you know, entry level jobs. I, I, I just, I didn't really have anybody to, to really look up to in that way. So I just kind of stumbled along and tried to find my own way. All right. Uh, that's good. I guess for the lesson learned uh, um, outside of that, as far as taking risks and, and uh, you know, bigger risk when you're younger and you can, you know, have the time to recover and things like that. And then also um, just getting out there and just networking early on, even if it's, even if you don't think you're in a position to do a deal yet, get into those local meetups because um, you'll find you'll learn about creative things like, you know, seller financing and master lease options and land contracts and subject to and all these super creative 
ways to get into real estate deals without having a whole lot of money down or, or like what you did wholesaling, like wholesaling is a, a huge, um, uh, you know, first step into real estate. Cause you don't need a whole lot of money at all. You need a list and a phone and you can, you can, you know, start wholesaling, right. Uh, start driving for dollars. Absolutely. Um, so not that that's great. Um, well, that was the end of my, my more formal kind of questions on here. So is there anything before we get into kind of like the fire round and transition to that, um, any other topics you want to nail on or, or impress upon the listeners uh, before we get into that? Um, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I would say for, you know, for your audience, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, you know, commercial real estate uh, as well is a, you know, is a really, um, you know, it's a really hot, um, you know, hot segment. Um, and I think that, you know, it'll be interesting to see the opportunities that, uh, that are coming up here. Um, and, uh, you know, I always encourage people that ask to, to just stay, consi- stay consistent, uh, continue marketing. And, um, you know, uh, um, again, try to try to kind of find that focus as opposed to doing what I did when I got started, which is kind of bounced around and, um, you know, continue to, uh, you know, continue to to, uh, uh, you know, listen to, to guys like you and, and, and others out there who are who are providing good, uh, you know, good advice, good insight. And uh, uh, and then always continue to network, you know the uh what do they say your your net your network is your net worth or something like that so um you know i have found over the years that to be extremely important so all right so i was going to transition but then you just said something that i'm going to dig into so you said um you know looking for opportunities you know coming up now we're recording this in may 27th 2022 Mm -hmm. um and the stock market's trash Crypto got obliterated. Uh, mm-hmm. Real estate days on market are are creeping up. Um, you know, as interest rates continue to rise, I, I guess they fell a little bit last week, but overall they're up. You know, and, and everybody's kind of on edge with you know everything going on in the world. So, for somebody that has been through a recession, the two thousand eight two thousand nine, you know, uh, real estate uh, bubble there and recession. What are some of the, I guess, similarities that you see now to where maybe 2007? And then, you know, what are some of the lessons learned uh, from you being in the game during that time that you're going to be hyper focused on uh, as we potentially go into another uh, recession here, uh, which a lot of economists are, are forecasting as we go into the end of 2022 and beginning of 2023, especially. Yeah. I mean, you know, just um, kind of take it, start, start backwards. Um, I, I think, um, you know, the big issue right now is the fed and trying to um, trying to deal with inflation while not um, inducing a recession. I think that's almost impossible. And I think there's going to be um, there's going to be some pain um, no matter, no matter how they go about it. Um, I think that, you know, the big issue right now that I see, especially being um, focused on the rehab side of things and end and buyers, is that, um, you know, rates have essentially doubled. Um, you know, they were incredibly low. What's interesting is in, you know, 2004, five, six, seven, leading up, um, rates were around 6% back then. So, you know, even higher than they are today. I think that um, as the rates start to get closer to like 10% um, on a 30 year mortgage, which I think is, is very possible. I think um, you're going to, it's going to become a lot more difficult to sell deals. Um, and so you, what you're going to see is you're going to see a reverse. Now it takes a long time for this to happen, right? It might take a couple of years for this to play out, but ultimately it'll become much easier to find deals and much harder to sell them. Right. Which is the, basically the opposite or the reverse of today. Um, some similarities, um, you know, so I was very fortunate that I, I only owned one, I think one piece of property, um, when the market crashed in 08, um, and the guys that owned tons of property on the bank, owed the banks tens of millions of dollars. They were fine. The guys that had nothing, they were fine. It was all the guys in the middle. So, um, you know, I think that, 
cash is cash is king. And so, you know, you got to be careful not to over leverage, um, but also be ready because, you know, you make your money when you buy real estate. And so the folks that are prepared for the opportunities that are going to come up uh, are going to be, um, you know, in a good spot and able to capitalize on those, those, um, you know, those buying opportunities. So I think you want to just um, be patient, but be ready. And then also, um, you know, understand that it's different from, you know, from the previous cycle in the sense that, you know, everybody's fully underwritten today. You know, we don't have this situation where um, the only exit for people um, was to essentially sell or refinance. Um, you know, today it's it's just totally different. Um, more stability. Um, everybody's fully underwritten, as I said. Um, the markets are stronger. Um, so, it, it, you know, is it going to crash? No, I don't think so. But I do think there's going to be a lot of buying opportunities, a lot of foreclosures and different things like that. So. Um, I, I would say just in general, just be prepared to, you know, be prepared to to um, to buy. But again, but be patient um, because these things take years to play out. You know, it might be a year or two before we start to see real pain, I guess, in the in the marketplace. No, great, great points. And then I guess I, I would just add to that, you know, as you're kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting to see, you know, where the dust settles, you can be educating yourself on those, I guess, creative financing structures uh, that I was talking about earlier, like mass lease option, seller financing, you know, because like to your point, if the market turns to the opposite of where it is now, where there's a bunch of people with deals that can't sell them, and maybe they have maturity dates coming up or balloon payments or something like that, well, you can be, you know, the, the knight in shining armor to come in and solve their problem because you know how to do, you know, creative financing structures to where, you know, whatever it is, um, like I said, like seller finance, master lease options or, or whatever. So, um, that is, you know, what you can be doing now while you're waiting for this to play out. Right. Um, good stuff. All right. Now we can go to the fire round. So fire round, um, same questions we ask everybody. And first thing that comes to mind. So what is your favorite book that you recommend other than Rich Dad Poor Dad? Favorite book that I recommend other. Um, so if you're, if, if I don't know if your listeners are familiar, but uh, uh, Gino Wickman's Attraction. Yes. So yeah. I got right, it right here. Bright seats. Yep. There you go. Yep. Boom. Yep. You can, you can but, see I've read it. Look at <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to say, mine looks the same, except yeah. for the highlighted up. Um, yep. Right people, right seats. Uh, yeah. Again, you know, being outsourcing and, and, you know, that whole business, it's kind of come about um, that I've, that book is, has been invaluable. So I, I'd say that. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, once you burn through that one, um, if you're the leader of your company, you got to read Rocket Fuel which is the follow-up to traction, which is focuses on the, the leadership team of a company, um, the visionary and integrator. So uh, those are, yeah, outstanding. We're, we, we were practicing EOS in my company. Um, I'm getting all my managers to read, read the books. So we can start um, practicing uh, EOS together. So EOS is an entrepreneurial operating system for those listening. It's just the system that the traction book uses to, you know, kind of organize the business. Um, and get everybody aligned and rolling in the right direction. So outstanding uh, program there. All right. What is your superpower? I thought it'd be cool to fly. Well, like your, your real life superpower, unless you can really fly. Oh, oh uh, <laughs> my real life superpower. Um, I guess underwriting valuations. Okay, you know? good. Um, I, I've, uh, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've always, um, I've always been, I've always felt really confident about that and always, always kind of pride myself on, on, uh, on, on valuations, on writing. That's good. Yeah. And a lot of people, they, uh, I, I talked to a lot of people where they're, they're very, like you said, um, you're confident, but a bunch of people are very not confident in their underwriting. They're always second guessing themselves. And then what happens is you end up into like a, um, analysis paralysis and you just never get into deals because you're, you're, you're not confident in the, your analysis, and you just never can pull the trigger. So uh, I would definitely say that is a superpower. Everybody's afraid to fail, which is understandable. Yeah. But un unfortunately, you, you almost have to fail. Like you, you, yeah. you have to be willing to fail because you're not always going to be right. Hopefully you're right more times than you're wrong. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and no, I, I can't actually fly. I mean, I guess I could 
maybe like nosedive, but the, you know, the end would be a problem. You fall with style, right? Like Buzz Lightyear. Um, good stuff. Uh, all right. What is the biggest lesson you learned over your career? Wow. Um, I'd say probably the biggest lesson is just kind of going back to what I said before, which is just be patient. Um, don't force it. You know, I, I, uh, I, I had a guy that I worked with for, for a while. Um, and, um, not formally, um, just kind of like joint venturing on stuff, I guess if you want to call it that. And, and he always talked about, um, do a dealitis and, and on these new folks would enter the business, they just got to do a deal. And they would, they would try to push everything. They would push the numbers. They would push, you know, um, where I'm very conservative and pass on, you know, 95% of stuff that comes across my desk. Um, so I would say be patient, you know, that's, that's definitely the, to, to me, that's one of the most important things. All right. Good. Good advice. Uh, for the busy working professional who is working toward financial freedom, what advice or tips do you have for them? Outsource as much as possible. Outsource as much as possible. I mean, right down to, you know, um, your own job, if you can. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, this, uh, you know, I love Tim Ferriss, uh, you know, but the idea of sitting on a beach and, and you know, drinking margaritas and, you know, mm -hmm. your company runs without you. Mm, I don't know. I don't I, I wouldn't be able to do that. I, I, I don't I'd like to lose my mind. Um, That's a lot harder, you know, in, in Tim Ferriss's, uh, not to cut you off, but like the four hour work week there, a lot of that was kind of geared toward like the e-commerce crowd. Exactly. A lot harder to do on real estate, definitely doable, but it, it's, uh, it's, you know, we have physical buildings, right. That we need to manage and, you know, stuff like that. So it's a, it's a lot harder, but a lot of the principles can, can are useful in that, that book and his concepts. Yeah. And so, so that's why I say, I say just outsource as much as possible. The reality is, you know, you're going to have to be involved in your business most likely on some level if you want true success. But um, yeah, just, just too many people, they try to do everything themselves. I mean, I'm guilty of this. Um, just not, not willing to just let go. Um, so yeah, as yeah. much as possible, just. Well, yeah. And you, you hit it uh, earlier in the show, we were talking about, you know, sit down and figure out the highest and best use of your time and yep. delegate everything else. Uh, there, there's some great books out there for that. Um, trying to think of some off like the one thing, it is definitely a good book for that. Um, highest and best use, uh, seven habits of highly effective people is another, uh, good book, um, for, for, to start getting into that mind frame. And they're, they're both, those are easy to easy reads, uh, very entertaining, but those are, those are great starts. Um, all right. Well, this has been an outstanding show, Max, uh, love having you on as a guest. Um, how can our listeners get a hold of you? Um, and, uh, they, if they want to reach out. Uh, yeah, I'd say um, uh, realestateprojectsolutions.com is uh, the website, uh, or they can find me on Facebook. All right. LinkedIn too, or? Yeah, I mean, all the social stuff. Okay, yeah. got it. So LinkedIn, Facebook, and the website. Yeah, LinkedIn, Instagram, all that stuff. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And we're, we're recording this on uh, the weekend of um, Memorial Day. So I hope you have a great Memorial Day. Um, and some time with your family. And uh, yeah, have a good one. I appreciate you having me, Vincent. Thank you.